It will be given by Professor Rob Rannan of Applied Science, Health Sciences and Wellness. And he's going to talk about our native pawpaws. But before he begins, I've got several announcements. Uh, the next Science Cafe will be on Monday. So don't make a note of that. It'll be Monday, October the 5th. That's an unusual day for us to have one, but that's when it's going to be. Um, random acts of, atta- of anatomy. Uh, a live guided tour of the Whitmer lab with Larry Whitmer and his students. The, the uh, next Science Cafe after that will be on Wednesday, October 21st. Paul Benedict, director of uh, the Centre for Entrepreneurship. Science Cafe information can be found at uh, uh, ohio.edu slash science cafe. I've got one final announcement uh, for uh, particular students. Uh, the Provost Undergraduate Research Fund um, is now open for proposals. Uh, this is where you can get small awards up to $1,500 to fund research and creative activity uh, conducted by undergraduates. These proposals are due uh, October 1 at 4 p.m. And now over to Professor Rob Brennan. Thank you, David. So let's uh, get started talking about pawpaws. I, behind me is the Food Innovation Lab here in Grover Center, so you get little glimpses of it, and I put some pawpaws out over here so that you can actually see. see I've got pawpaws. Um, so, uh, but I, I do have a little, like, just not very long um, slide set prepared, so I can kind of take you through some things about the pawpaw, and then uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions, and please ask during. So I'm going to figure out how to share my screen when I use Teams. It's like every time is the first time for me, so please forgive me. All right, let's see here. I think if I do this one. All right. So hopefully you guys can see my screen pretty good. Rox, everyone, am I good you on that? You can see it. It's great. Perfect. Perfect. So this is my first slide with my title. You don't need to know about that. I am a food scientist in the Division of Food and Nutrition Sciences here at Ohio University, and so. What a food scientist does is that we're not the people that grow the food. We're the ones that take it once it's been grown, either harvested or uh, if it's of animal origin. And then uh, we kind of take it through until it hits your fork, right? And then once you put it here and it goes down like this, then that's where the uh, when the nutrition folks come in. So I've been doing pawpaw research at Ohio University for a long time, and we're not going to go through this. This is just a, a laundry list of the half a dozen or so different um research activities that I have ha- either had going on or have going on now, including updating its nutrition. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, looking at what it tastes like, its flavor and aroma. We'll talk a little bit about that. Its antioxidant capacity. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, cell wall components, we won't talk about too much because you probably don't care. Um, the, the stuff that turns the pawpaw brown, we'll mention a little bit about that as well. So not going to spend any time on this one. So what is a pawpaw? So you go to the internet and you type in the word pawpaw and you're as likely to find information on a papaya, what we call a papaya, as you are a pawpaw. Because in a lot of places in the world, particularly Africa, the papaya's nickname is the pawpaw. Okay, so let's not get confused there. So what is a pawpaw? Well, the genus and species is a semina, a semina trilobe, the genus and species. It has plenty of names, pawpaw, and then Appalachian banana. Pretty much you can take the word banana, you can put anything in front of it you want to, and it'll be a nickname for the pawpaw. So if you're in Indiana, they call it the Indiana banana or the Hoosier banana. There's a Kansas banana, there's a Kentucky banana, right, like that. So then there's a lot of other names for the pawpaw. Um, So here's some science, right? It is Science Cafe. No, I'm not a botanist, but the taxonomy of the pawpaw, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If, I want you to pay attention to the bottom three, particularly the family, okay? Ananaceae family, all right? And I'm going to ask you a question so you can start thinking about it now and you can shoot your answer on the chat, which is what's so special about the pawpaw compared to every other member of its family, of this Ananaceae family, all right? So maybe to help you get there, let's look at some of these. So these are going to be cousins to the pawpaw. So here's a pawpaw cousin, sugar apple. This guy's a little bit smaller than a baseball. You can see the, the, the tissue and then the seeds embedded in the tissue. That's going to be very common for these ananaceous fruits. So if you've had one of these, let us know. Here's the cherimoya. This one um, is fairly 
popular here in the U.S. I've seen it in the Northeast more than I have down here in Ohio. But uh, this is Cherimoy. If you take those two and you cross them, you get this. Now, actually, there's a, something called an Atamoya that I'm not 100% sure. I think that's a cross, too. So, anyway, I'm not exactly sure. I've never had this one before. There's another one, Custard Apple. Again, you can see the cut fruit has those seeds embedded in it, right? That's a characteristic of these kind of fruits. The, this, this one... The uh, Sarasop or the Graviola, worldwide, this is probably the one that's consumed the most. In Asia, it has another name. They call it Guanabana. Okay? So um, I have a, a student now, an undergraduate honor student, who's doing some pawpaw work for me. She's from Brazil, and she's had this Graviola. It's, you know, it's, it's a bigger, generally bigger than a pawpaw, but it's not huge. It fits in the palm of your hand. Like this. Okay, so these are all pawpaw's cousins from the family Ananaceae. All right, now here's our friend, the pawpaw. So this one has a nice yellow color, uh, but you can see the seeds are embedded in the tissue here, okay? All right, so that question, right? Do we know why the pawpaw is special compared to its cousins? Let's figure it out. All those ananaceous fruits that I just described, every one of them is a tropical fruit. So here we've got a world map. The tropical area is shown in this brown or red area, right? So we're talking about Central America, um, most of South America, Central Africa, the uh, subcontinent in Asia, and the Pacific Islands, tropical, okay? All those fruits are tropical. All those ananaceous fruits are tropical, except for the pawpaw. Pawpaw is temperate, means, you know, cold, like here in Ohio, right? So the pawpaw is a tropical fruit. It's a, it's a fruit of a tropical family, okay? but it doesn't grow in a tropical climate. And it's the only fruit, well, that I know of, which means there might be others. It's the only fruit in the Ananaceae family, in this tropical family, that is temperate, that grows in a temperate climate. So it's a highly unusual fruit, right? So the question people always ask, how to get up here? I have no idea, right? There's these, you know, a bird ate one and, you know, you know what, as it was flying over Ohio. Hey, that's as good a story as any, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, so highly unusual fruit, okay? All right. So here's some, I had a student, I still have her. She's in a graduate student in our program now, and she told me she was an artist, and I was like, yeah, right. And then she drew me these pictures, and I was like, holy moly. Uh, in fact, this poster back here we made out of these pictures. So these are just representations of different parts of the pawpaw. So the tree can be pretty big, right? You know, 15, 20 to 30 or 40 feet, the big ones. Um, usually they're not that big. And it, it, it's characterized by this long, long, long tap root. So one thing I do know about growing pawpaws, trees, is that if you try to transplant them and you don't get that tap root all the way out, you got a dead pawpaw tree. Uh, so um, you can see the beautiful purple blossom that comes out in the spring and representations of the, uh, the whole fruit and then the different shapes that you can get cut fruit. So when it comes to growing pawpaws, I went out the other day and I counted, I have an acre and a quarter, and I counted all the pawpaw trees on my property, and I come up with the same number this year as I did last year, which is zero, okay? So I don't have any pawpaw trees on my property, so I'm really not the grower guy. I know a lot about it just because I've been kind of living in that world, so if you have questions, feel free to ask, but I don't, I go around and I harvest other people's or wild pawpaws okay so like these pawpaws that i have right here these didn't, don't come from the brandon property okay one of the things i think people don't realize about pawpaw is that there's a lot of different varieties of these fruit right if i told you that there's this green apple called a granny smith and it's really sour and it's green and then there's this red apple right like a honey crisp or a red delicious or something like that and it's very sweet you wouldn't think anything about it Right? But for some reason, people tend to think there's only one kind of pawpaw, but that's not true, right? There's a lot of different varieties. You have big ones and small ones and ones that have more, more cream-colored fruit and one that have more orange fruit, and, you know, small seeds and big seeds and all that genetic variation that exists within the pawpaw. And the wild ones are pretty good, too. Hey, Rob, I have yeah. our first question based on got? that slide. They want to know... What's your favorite pawpaw for eating? Out of those varieties, how many have you tried and which ones are your favorites? So I've tried a lot of them on this sheet right here. I've tried every one because I've worked on these. I've probably had 40 different varieties of pawpaw. Um, the ones that I have here are 
uh, from a local tree that's gotten its name, uh, Rana, R-A-N-A. This, this is the best that I've ever had, but it's only a single tree. It hasn't been propagated as far as I know. This is lit these are literally the best that I've ever had. On this list, of the ones that you see here, these dozen or so varieties on this list, I really like Susquehanna's flavor. The problem with Susquehanna is that they, they grow big and round, right, rather than long and skinny, and they crack. So a lot of the fruit that comes off the tree is cracked and you can't use it, right? But they're really good. Um, the ones that have the little uh, register, and Susquehanna is one of them, it has a little registered symbol next to it. Those are our trademark pawpaws. So KSU is Kentucky State University. Atwood is a really good pawpaw. The other ones come from Peterson pawpaw. Neil Peterson's kind of the guru of pawpaws over in West Virginia. Yeah. So, yeah. So I've tried a lot of these. Thank you. My mm -hmm. pleasure. Okay, pawpaw nutrition. So for years and years and years, we had one source of pawpaw nutrition, and the problem with it, it's not inaccurate, it's not inaccurate, the problem with it is it included the pulp and the skin, right? Well, we don't eat the pawpaw skin, we just eat the pulp on the inside. So the information, skins are very nutritious things, right? So it tended to over-report certain nutrients, right? But this was all we had. So you'd go to the pawpaw festival, or you'd go online, and this would be the pawpaw nutrition that's out there, okay? Well, recently I got a grant to look at the uh, nutritional information of the pawpaw pulp. Mm -hmm. and, and so this information, I'm gonna put it up on the next slide. So you're one of the first ones to see this. Now, you're not allowed to use this, okay? So because I got to go get this stuff published. It's in the process of happening right now. So if any of you say, uh, Rob Brandon gave me permission to use this, you don't, but anyway. So what is it? So one of the things we did was we started comparing a, a serving of pawpaw to a serving of these other fruits, rather than a weight to weight, because serving size is probably how we're going to consume it. So pawpaw is very, very similar to a banana nutritionally. Okay? That's not a bad place to be, right? It's not a bad place to be. So I'm not going to go through these numbers, but if you look at the pawpaw, it's comparable in protein. It's low in protein. It's not a high protein fruit. It's comparable in fat. It's low in fat. It is high in carbohydrate, especially fiber. Okay. So on a on a on a ser serving size basis, it tends to have more fiber than any of the other fruits. That's a good thing, right? It's um, it's not particularly high in vitamin C. It's middle of the road in calcium, iron, potassium, right? So it's a good solid fruit as far as its, as its nutrition goes. It's like a banana. That's a good thing. Okay. So pop antioxidants. So um, let's see, maybe. Can I get rid of you here, Roxanne? Let me see. I don't know if you can see the little cartoon. It's not mine. We can okay. see your cartoon. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I don't, I don't even know if it's funny. I just needed some something to fill that spot on the slide. So there are these compounds in foods that are called antioxidants. I'm sure you've heard of them before. And all the scientists that are looking at this slide right now must be going crazy because it's not labeled in any of this kind of stuff. So, But there is a, a pretty straightforward uh, test that you can do in the lab to determine um, you can measure the amount of phenolic compounds that are in food, okay? And phenolics, um, every phenolic is an antioxidant. There's probably a few, well, there are a few antioxidants that are not phenolic compounds, but the vast majority of them are. So this is kind of an index of how many antioxidants are in there. It doesn't tell you whether they're good or bad or, you know, whether they target certain things. It's just how much is in there. So blueberry, pomegranate, cranberry, these are the ones we typically talk about being very high in antioxidants, and they are. On a, on a comparative basis, a kilogram basis, I, I surveyed pawpaw for even more years than this. And they're not, they, they never come up as high as a blueberry, or pomegranate, or cranberry, but they're rock solid. I mean, they're right in the game. You can say I put banana and mango on here. There are other fruits that will be typically lower, like an apple, right, would be a little bit lower. But they're right in the game. I have a different paper where we looked at the actual composition of them, and they have several of these sort of rock star antioxidants, the ones that you find in red wine and dark chocolate, and the ones that everybody talks about, cranberries. So, um, so they have good quality antioxidants, and they're in there in you know quite a good quantity. Okay, so good fruit, camp comparable to a banana um, nutritionally, and then as far as its antioxidant profile, just right there with the big names in the antioxidant world of fruits. So, so that's good. So pawpaws. 
Hey, Rob, we got a question for you. Ready. Okay. Antioxidants, super fruits. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What? Why do we care about antioxidants and what's a super fruit? Well, so the, the, the moniker super fruit has come essentially to mean that it has this a uh, high amount of antioxidants. That's where the superfood monikers come from. So even like some of these niche fruits like an acai, right? A-C-A-I, that fruit is very high in antioxidants. So antioxidants themselves, so there are these processes in your body that are deteriorative processes as we get older, right? These kinds of things that are almost always oxidative processes. So mm -hmm. these oxidative processes are bad. Antioxidative, antioxidants, which slow them down, right? Those are good. Okay. So it's a lot okay. of cellular, a lot of cellular stuff, a lot of disease states, a lot of things have to do with consuming antioxidants. And so the more you have, and it depends on the profile of them as well, the actual composition of what you have is an inner, uh, all that inner, it gets put together. And then if you're a blueberry or a pomegranate or a cranberry, and you have these really good antioxidants in a really large number, hey, that's a super fruit. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. All right. There's only a few more slides, I promise. What's it taste like? Okay, what does it taste like? So, um, a few years back now, I did a, a study with a whole lot of people, consumers, and I gave them a little cup of pawpaw. I didn't tell them what it was, and I said, taste this, and tell me what your most intense flavor is. And 40% said it tastes like a banana, 24% said it tastes like a mango. The next highest was, I can't tell. All right, so 15% of people ate a pawpaw and couldn't pick out one identifiable flavor. But, you know, two-thirds picked banana or mango. Then I said, okay, so it tastes like a banana or mango that for your most intense flavor. What's your second most intense flavor? Well, it's a banana and a mango. Okay. So, and, but actually the winner of second most intense flavor was did not identify at 44%, right? So we're not that good at picking out these flavors. So it... Your mm -hmm. pawpaw across mm -hmm. all those 80 varieties is going to have characteristics of a mango and a banana in one of those orders. Now, you can have a variety that can be very pineapple flavor, or there's a variety that elicits a lot of coconut flavor. Now, typically, it won't be at the intensity of banana and mango, but there are all these other flavors. So that tree out there that you're getting your pawpaws from, right, you're going to get mm -hmm. a little banana, you're going to get a little mango, but it's going to have its own inherent sort of flavor profile to go along with it. Banana mango, banana mango, banana mango, banana mango. Okay. That's kind of sort of what it tastes like. Now, um, same study, same consumers. I gave them three little cups. One had pawpaw, one had mango, one had papaya. I said, taste them, tell me which one you like the best. Pretty straightforward. 70% like the mango the best. Of the 30%, um, remaining split among papaya and pawpaw. So we're comparing tropical fruits here, obviously. Interestingly, when at the 70%, so I said, w w the one you like the best, tell me what you think it is. So of the 70% that like the mango best, only one third could identify it as a mango. Put the other way, two thirds had no idea it was a mango, but they liked it. For the papaya, right, for the 14% that liked the papaya, 75%, three quarters, couldn't identify it as papaya, okay? And for the pawpaw, right, it was less than one in 10 could identify it as a pawpaw. So we're not that great at identifying these tropical flavors, okay? So you have this tropical fruit that grows here in Ohio, and it's, you know, it's this wonderfully banana-y, mango-y flavor, right? It's just we're not that great at picking that out is kind of what this thing. A little bit more on flavor. So there are people who are highly trained to taste and, and describe flavors, okay? And so I have had a, what's called a descriptive uh, sensory panel here at Ohio University since 2006, okay? Mm -hmm. So many of your colleagues, I could name names, but I won't. And these are highly, highly trained people to figure out all of the flavors that are in a whole myriad of foods. And there's been descriptive analysis on the on the pawpaw uh, three times. About 10 years ago, my group here, um, my predecessor, so the name Dufferin is Melanie Dufferin. She's a big shot dean somewhere now, but she uh, 
was my predecessor at Ohio University, so that study was done right here at Ohio University. And then the McGrath study was done at the University of Maryland, and I was a student at that time, and I actually participated in that study. Mm -hmm. So I won't get into all the details, but you can see some of the attributes that these trained panelists picked out. Obviously, sweet and sour and bitter, those are the basic tastes. Banana, mango, melon, okay, so you get a little melon in there, right? You get this tropical papaya kind of thing. Citrusy or rindy, rindy, like you bite into the rind of an orange, you know, oh. that, and then astringent. Roxy, you got a question? I do, but keep going. It's going to be about sensory panels. I think you have some interest. Sounds good. So um, what what's what's important is that yes, here's the here's these words that describe the flavor of the pawpaw. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are the intensities of them? So I just th this is an arbitrary zero to five scale. This could be a zero to a hundred scale. Okay. It's just it's you know so two is twice as much as one and four is twice as much as two. It's just an arbitrary scale. The most intense flavors are sweet banana, mango, and bitter. Okay, so with a pawpaw, you pick a pawpaw, you're going to get sweet banana mango and some bitter. Now, bitter's not great, right? Bitter's not a great flavor unless we're drinking beer, right? mm -hmm. on beer. Then you get the melony, papaya-like flavors. Then you get sour and this rindy and astringent. And those are pretty high intensity. And those are more negatively associated flavors. Okay, so the pawpaw is this combination of really, really good stuff and just lurking in there can be some stuff that is a little bit off-putting, okay? So, all right. So I'm on to browning. You want to ask the sensory question or you want me to keep on rolling? I would love to ask the sensory question. Um, you actually have two questions. So one of them is um, that they say that they like the taste of the pawpaw, but they're not sure about the texture. <laughs> and they were wondering if you did any studies on the texture of papaya. I'm sorry, of pawpaw. I well, just made the mistake. <laughs> that's all right. So the paw pawpaw is not, so I'm gonna open this up and tell me what you guys can see. So pawpaw is a very soft textured fruit. Mm -hmm. okay? It's very soft textured. And there are really no firm textured pawpaws out there. So you're not going to ever get a pawpaw that you can take when I mean, you can take a bite and squeeze some of this into my mouth. But you're never going to get a pawpaw that is is going to, you know, have any more firmness than what you have in there. As the paw, as any fruit ages, but as the pawpaw ages, the, the, the texture kind of becomes softer even than it is now. So mm -hmm. all break down and stuff like that. So if it's, it's been a couple of days even, Mm -hmm. then it'll even be softer. So you're either, I mean, it's one of those things, right? You're either going to really like the creamy texture of it and it's the way it's coat your mouth, or maybe it's going to be a little off-putting. So that's the best thing I can tell you on pawpaw. So the study, to say the study, the texture on the pawpaw, what we're trying to do there is sort of extend the shelf life so that it doesn't uh, get too soft. So it can be mm -hmm. shipped whole and those kind of things, but it's been a challenge. Okay. The other question that we have about the sensory panel is, I think somebody wants to join and wants to know if you are recruiting. <laughs> so I'll have to check. So this is a, this is a research uh, panel. So it is um, the, the way that we do things is controlled by the Institutional Review Board here at Ohio University, the IRB, uh -huh. the Institutional Review Board for the Protection of Human Subjects and Research. So the way that I recruit is dictated by that approval. Um, but certainly, if someone wants to reach out to me um, and um, and send me an email, then we'll see. Right now, because of COVID, we're kind of on hiatus, as you can imagine. So there is human subjects research that's happening, but there's very strict protocols that are in place. And so I've just been kind of waiting to see, you know. But yeah, so yeah, if you're interested, let me know. Now, the thing about being a, a taster is to be one of these expert tasters, you have to be screened. Okay, so mm -hmm. I give you a solution that has two basic tastes in there. You have to be able to taste it and say, well, there's it's salty and it's uh, sweet, right? Or, you know, like that. So there's an intense amount of training and there is a screening process that will go into it as well. So, yeah. Okay. I do have one more question. Uh, they're, they're just popping up right now. Um, so do you know what gives the papa a fermented taste even though it's not fermented? 
Well, that's a good question. If you look at our, um, at our, oh, I may have taken the one out. The uh, the um, study that I did, that fermenty kind of taste with, was it rolled into it like a generic tropical fermented taste. So I know exactly what you're talking about, and. I took out, so I don't have the, the slide in here. I took it out because it was a little too sciencey. So when I was at the University of Maryland way back when, they would take the pawpaw, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's a machine called a gas chromatogram, and you can extract the flavor compounds. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. You can extract the flavor compounds of the pawpaw. And identify what they are <clears throat> okay and so then you'll you mean you can these are just chemicals and you can smell them and some of them have that sort of fermented kind of smell to them right some of them smell like banana like ethyl acetate smells like banana so if you ever had a candy that has fake banana in it, it's because it has ethyl acetate in it right like that so it's just it's it's the chemicals that are in there that elicit those flavor sensations so yeah and and they're they, they definitely it definitely tastes a little like a little fermenty. There's no question about it. Maybe you'll get into talking about pawpaws and beer a little later on. No, absolutely. I think that's probably where most of the pulp from an in, it's not, the pawpaw industry is small. But I, I would say most of the pulp right now is going into beer at, right, at this time of the year. So, yeah. All right. So one of the bad things about a pawpaw is it turns brown. So if I were to... <clears throat> If I were to show you this in maybe an hour's time or something, it would it would be brown. In fact, it may even happen even quicker than that. Uh, but we know stuff turns brown. So there's a picture of the apple. Half the apple's been treated with you know citrus or uh, vitamin C. The other half hasn't, and the half that hasn't turns brown. The upper right picture is an avocado, right? So you scoop the stuff out of the avocado, you let it sit, it turns brown. We all know that. You cut a potato, it turns brown. You may not know about tea, which is on the bottom panel there. So the difference between green tea and oolong tea, which is the second in, and black tea, which are the other two, is, is simply the leaves turning brown. And what's, it's an enzymatic process. The things that are turning green tea into oolong and then into black tea is the same mechanism that's going to make a pawpaw turn brown. It's the same mechanism that's going to make your banana turn brown. It's the same mechanism that's going to make your avocado, your potato, your apple turn brown. Right? So that's the difference. Um, so pawpaw turns brown, right? So what are we going to do about it? Well, the local company here, uh, Integration Acres, you can, they're out at the farmer's market, Michelle Gorman and the commissioner, the, they, uh, they put ascorbic acid in there, right? So you can, you know, you can use citrus or ascorbic acid and prevent browning and it works pretty good in their packs of pulp, right? That's good. Um, but I had an, we have an idea to use this technique called high pressure processing. And so I, I don't know, I think, I think it's interesting. So maybe you do, so I'll describe it for you. There's a alum of Ohio University and he owns a food company up in Medina called Sandridge. And we actually, our culinary services buys a ton of food from them. And a lot of their food is high pressure processed. So usually when we think about food processing, we think about heat, right? We're gonna heat it up, right? Like that. Well, high pressure is not heat. High pressure is pressure. So if you look at the cartoon right in the side of the page, it's like pressure. It's like 10,000 elephants standing on the food, right? And what that does is it can kill microorganisms, especially pathogenic microorganisms, the one that makes us sick. And it can also inactivate enzymes, the enzymes that turn the food brown, a bunch of other things too. The machine is on the left there. You can see it's a very big fancy machine. You put these pouches of food in those blue things and they go in and then it makes a bunch of noises and then it comes out the other side. The success story with high pressure processing is guacamole. So you go to your refrigerated section of the grocery store wearing mm -hmm. your mask and mm -hmm. there's guacamole there. So I recently celebrated my 27th anniversary of my 29th birthday. So if you are of an age like me, you can remember not that long ago, there was no mm -hmm. uh, prepared guacamole in the refrigerated mm -hmm. section in the produce section, excuse me, of the grocery store because it would be brown or black. You just could not control the browning. Mm -hmm. Through high pressure processing, you can control the browning. So they take these packets, they're usually there in the tubs with the sealed lids on them, right? And you put them mm -hmm. in that machine 
and you high pressure process them and they don't turn brown. So then you rip off the thing. So the success story is guacamole, right? So we're thinking, okay, let's do it with the pawpaw. Works with the avocado. Let's do it with the pawpaw. So the first thing we did was the whole fruit and probably not going to work for the whole fruit. Uh, the, um, you know, 10,000 elephants standing on a fruit, especially a soft fruit is probably not the best thing. So it got very soft and it cracked and the cells kind of smooshed and liberated some of their moisture. And so it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. What about the pulp? Well, it didn't work for the pulp either. All right. So what it did was I actually did the studies where we looked at the enzyme itself mm -hmm. and you need, you need to inhibit the enzyme. You got to take its activity to zero and it, it reduced the activity of the enzyme. So it delayed some of the browning, but not by enough. And so, yeah. Not by enough. So anyway, so I thought that stuff's interesting. So that's why I presented it to you. I don't have anything else to say other than you've asked me what superfruit is. I've given you all this information, the pawpaw. Okay, so maybe you guys can kind of decide. If I can figure out how to get out of this thing, um, then we can have a conversation. As soon as you do that, Rob, you know the question I'm gonna ask, so get that spoon ready. I don't need a spoon. <laughs> Okay, so, so the question is, is people would like to see you eat a pawpaw. How do you open it up and scoop it out? Well, I've already opened this one, and, I, and I'll eat off this one. But uh, one thing I will show you is um, the uh, two, um, let's see, maybe I'll do this one. So uh, pawpaw has, a fat, has like a fatter side and then a more narrow side. And if you go in on the more narrow side, if you go in that way, then you... You'll come right, you'll come, I should, I should wear gloves, but you'll come right across the seeds, okay? So you can see, well, I'm going to turn it this way. So you, I don't know if you can see this or not. Where's the pawpaw? So the right seeds there, are, now we can see it. So the seeds are going this way across the fruit. So if you come in that way, right, then you're not never going to be able to get it in half. So you got to come in the other way, and then you can just peel off the skin, right? You can peel off the skin and try to separate out the seeds. Now what I do, like this one, I just rip this one in half, and then I'm going to scoosh this part. I guess I need to be a little higher. Scoosh this part into my mouth. Right. And then you just work the... I love the spit. Sure. Okay, but before you do, now There's I have a question. There's the seed. So that's how what I... What are the flavors? What are the notes in that particular papa? What do you, as a sensory panelist, taste? So, the reason that I think this variety is so special is not what you taste, it's what you don't. There is an absence of the bitter, and there's a little astringent. So, astringent is the feeling on your tongue, like if you have a raw banana kind of makes the top hair on your tongue raise up a little bit. There's an absence of that in this variety of pawpaw, okay? So it, so all the other flavors, so certainly sweetness, certainly banana, certainly mango, certainly a little bit of melon, right? So those things are good. I'm gonna have some more because it's good and I'm hungry, it's dinner time. But that's how I eat a pawpaw, okay? I just suck this thing out and then spit out the seeds. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you got a question from Emma. She wants to know, okay, you've convinced her. She wants to go out in the woods and go pick some pawpaws or buy if she has to. Where is she going? Well, pawpaw patches, are a lot of them around here are by like little rivers and creeks and things like that. Once you know the what the leaves look like, they're pretty identifiable. So this is a pawpaw leaf. Okay, so this will hang on the tree. So like, like this, they'll hang on the tree, you know, in bunches. Okay. So this is a pretty unusual looking leaf. So if you find a plant that has a leaf looks like this, chance starts pop off. They're out there now. Um, people are very protective of where their pawpaw patches are. So they may send you on a wild goose chase so that you don't go collecting them. Okay. I actually found some. Uh, unexpectedly one time when I was playing disc golf at the Hawking College disc golf course they send you up into the woods and back in there there's these pawpaws that look pretty good my kid played my, my 
my kid played tennis at high, Athens High School. We'd go over to Marietta, right behind the tennis courts. There's one pawpaw tree, really delicious pawpaws. Kids are like, ooh, you're eating those? Like, yes, sir. Free food. So anyway, so they're around. If you're going to buy them, the best place to buy them would be at the market, at Integration Acres. But um, I, I just heard anecdotally today that they are, they're coming in late, so they may not have any yet. So these ones, this tree is probably a third to a half of its fruit has fallen. So the season was a little bit, a little bit late this year. So, yeah. Okay. So if let's just say that you get a pop up and you collect that seed, how old does a pop up tree have to be before you start getting fruit? So first of all, there's a special thing you have to do to these seeds in order to propagate them. But if you propagate it properly and you plant this, you're looking at three, four, five years before it's going to fruit. All right. And one of the things about the pawpaw, <clears throat> pardon me. So you eat a pawpaw. It's the best pawpaw you've ever had. You collect the seeds from this pawpaw. The pawpaw, this is not unusual, right? Apples are the same way. The, the pawpaw that grows isn't necessarily going to be true to the seed that planted it. Okay. So you're not guaranteed. There's probably a high genetic likelihood of it, but you're not guaranteed that you're going to get this delicious pawpaw, right? If you plant these seeds. So what they recommend with these known varieties is if you plant a pawpaw tree and you know you like, you know, Shenandoah or you know you like KSU Atwood, is then you go get that plant and you actually graft that plant onto your rootstock and that way you know what you're getting. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Now the seeds, and I'm not the guy that use all the right words, but the seeds have to be um, handled uh, properly so you can't dry the seed out. Right. So usually you have to take just take all your seeds and you put them in like a uh, uh, paper towel and put them in a plastic bag with some moisture in there and put them in the fridge. So they have to stay moist and they have to stay cold. Right. So they in, in other words, you can plant them now and they go through a winter in like wet soil. So you so you can either plant them now and they go through the winter in wet soil or you can do that process. So, yeah, it, it's might be like some other plants where you just take a, a bag of potting soil, you know, a baggie, yep. you wet it down a little bit, you put your seed in it, you close it so it's sealed, and then you just put it in the refrigerator it's, it's until exactly. it starts sprouting, and then you can put it in a pot. Stratification. Yeah, well, these you don't these don't these you don't sprout. You plant them before they sprout. If they sprout, then I don't think they're going to grow. But yes, that's exactly okay. the process. Yep. So. Okay. Excellent. Okay, another question for you. We, uh, what do we know about the bad GI effects of pawpaw for some people? I guess some people have problems digesting. So it, 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 I've never heard of GI effects of pawpaw. Well, it's, it, it, I guess it is a gastrointestinal thing. So 100 years ago, more, when um, anyone who's had children knows that when you have a small child, you have to have this stuff called Ipecac syrup, right? Which mm -hmm. is an emetic. Okay. Yeah. So that's a fancy way of saying it makes you throw up. So when you concentrate down stuff in the pawpaw, there's a high concentration of a chemical in here that's an emetic. It makes you throw up. Okay. So that's the that's what I think a lot of people are susceptible to with pawpaw is when they consume a lot of it, they you know their GI distress manifests itself as vomiting because it, there is an emetic that's in here. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you're susceptible to it, you're susceptible to it. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's all about. OK, um, another question for you. What are the some of the possible uses or hopes for use for pawpaws in the future? Like commercially, if you're talking commercially, the industry is still pretty small. So it's it's you know, it, there, there's just not that many plants. In fact, um, um, I was reading about the pawpaw and in the 1950s around that time, the USDA was putting out information that was describing the pawpaw as an invasive species and telling people to rip it out. So I think a lot of the natural pawpaws that are around got removed, physically removed. So there's just not that much pawpaw around. Now, the mm -hmm. local company, Integration Acres, they've um, been able to do well with wild pawpaws on the property that they have and also people bring them in. But so the, so the number of it is small. So there is this nascent pawpaw industry. People are interested in the fruit. Uh, beer, obviously, is number one, I think, use of the pawpaw right now. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about beer for the for the folks that take the time to 
separate the pulp from the seeds in the skin is that you can put it in bigger tubs. You don't have to package it in one pound type things. Um, but sauces, you know, things like that, people put it in baked goods. So much more sort of commercial, I mean, non-commercial sort of home use type things. Now, one thing you can't do because of that emetic is you can't dry this. So you can't make a leather out of this, okay? Because that's going to give you the wrong stuff. Okay. I don't, well, I don't, I don't know if that answered the question, but it, it did. But now we have two food questions for you. So the first one is, what's your favorite papa recipe or product? So I, I uh, personally don't cook too much with the papa when they come in. So I work with them in the lab. So I have a lot of papa laying around. But I will eat the papas just like you see me eat a papa. So that's how I sort of interact with the papa. All right, but. Um, I, I uh, for been going to the festival for years, and I coordinate the educational activities of the festival for the last however many years now. And there's a lot of pawpaw foods that are down there, and I uh, run the pawpaw cook-off, so I've seen all these delicious dishes. So it's very, very versatile, right? People uh, tend to like the pawpaw ice cream, right? So Snowville makes a pawpaw ice cream, and uh, it's really, really good. It also works well. So if you think about the negative flavor characteristics that I've described, the bitter and sour and astringent and things like that. Things where those aren't going to be um, necessarily bad is a good application for it. So a lot of like mustardy kind of sauces, like biting you know, salad mm -hmm. dressing sauces and things that will work really, really well. Um, also using it in the same way that you would use apples or bananas in baked goods, again, you know, is, is, mm -hmm. is, is really delicious. And then um, you know, we're revamping the North American Pawpaw Growers Association and myself and several people are revamping their cookbook based on some of the winning entries from the festival over the past few years. And there's just been some incredible, uh, incredible entries and really creative uses of, of the pawpaw over the years. So. Okay, well, um, I just want to remind everybody that you did give us a pawpaw ice cream recipe that we put up on Twitter um, at Bobcats Discover. And if Eli, you're listening in the back room, maybe you could just put the link to Bobcats Discover so people can get the recipe for um, the ice cream. We have um, another question. Uh, somebody wants to know, have you ever tried Jackie O's pawpaw wheat beer? <laughs> or do you have a favorite pawpaw beer? So yes and yes. So Jackie O's pawpaw wheat. So, so the festival didn't happen this year because of COVID, and that was a shame. But when I uh, took over the educational activities of the festival, one of the first things we did was we started having a brewers roundtable. We bring all we bring all the brewers in from all the beers at the festival, and they would talk about their beer. And mm -hmm. so uh, um, BC at Jackie O's is no longer over there, but he did it for the past however many years for Jackie O's, and that recipe that for the pawpaw wheat actually came from the Marietta Brewing Company, okay? And um, Kelly Sauber, who now owns the cider house in town and the distillery across the street, is the one who developed that recipe. And it's a very high uh, alcohol, uh, kind of a very high alcohol version of their ras wheat, right? And when you put the pawpaw with all that sugar in there, it ferments, so it's very high in alcohol. And it's mm -hmm. good. Um, the other breweries in town, um, make really good pawpaw beer. So last year, uh, so um, let me get my schedule right. We we're also running a homebrew contest at pawpaw beer at the festival. And what we did is the winner of the homebrew contest, Devil's Kettle, the, one of the mm -hmm. breweries in town will make that beer. And the winner from the Holrich brothers up in um, Logan was a pawpaw goza, which is a kind of a sour, salty sour with coriander, it was delicious. And mm. it was, they made it at the festival last year, it was wonderful. And then uh, Little Fish makes their, uh, well, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but their, theirs is uh, also a, a, a sour, pawpaw sour. It's really, really good. Uh, why can't I think of it? It's flitting on the edge of my consciousness, so forgive me. So the folks in town make really good ones. Maple Lawn Brewery, which is down in, um, in uh, Pomeroy, they make a pawpaw cream ale that at the festival is perfect because usually it's hot as you know what and it's a lighter beer that has a lot of pawpaw flavor in it. Mm -hmm. um, Weasel Boy up in um, uh, 
uh, I think they're in, are they in Zanesville? Anyway, they are at Bennett Jay's, the brewer up there. They, I uh, forgot which beer they make. They make the Paw Paw. I can't think of it, but theirs is really, really good too. Uh, the new brewery in Jackson, not new, three or four years old, they come to the festival and they, and then a couple of the guys from Columbus. So there's plenty of them out there. This is the time. So they're still, they still should be in production. So. Okay. Well, it sounds like a lot of people are going to be tasting a lot of products. Um, somebody's asking, how do you add nutrition information for a food to the USDA database? And I guess the first thing I'm going to say is, I hope you didn't take a snapshot of that slide that Rob said you couldn't use until he publishes it. But Rob, once you publish that data, will that information be available so people will have a better sense of the nutritional value of the pawpaw. So that was the justification for the grant was the fact that we did so. There was pawpaw information in the USDA nutrient database until 1963. Okay. So, um, and then it wasn't there anymore after that. No one really knows why. Maybe because they ripped out all the trees in the 50s. Who knows? But anyway, <laughs> so it hasn't been there for 57 years. And so when we started this project a few years ago, uh, we contacted the uh, USDA and we asked them what you have to do. And it's kind of a it's kind of a big thing. I won't get into all the details because you can't just go and like take one fruit and then a analyze one fruit and say that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So they want a representative sample both geographically and across all the varieties and these kinds of things. And there's not that many pawpaw out there. So we kind of negotiated back and forth and came up with a sampling plan that the USDA was uh, willing to accept. And then interestingly, since we did that, now the the foods that can enter the database, uh, they need to be analyzed at a specific like USDA approved lab. And so the place that we had it analyzed was a contract uh, lab in Cincinnati, Q Labs, which actually is owned by an Ohio University graduate. So uh -huh. anyway, so they're um, they're um, they're not on the list, but they're perfectly fine. So we've been communicating with the folks from the USDA. I think everything is just because of COVID. Everything is just kind of slowing down right now. So it's going to be in the database, and it's going to be in there pretty soon. So. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Okay. Somebody wants to know. They went out to their tree. They had pawpaws. They weren't quite ripe. They went back. There were no pawpaws. What ate them? Well, I don't Any know. Ideas? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what ate them, but what you're describing is another one of the issues that pawpaw has to kind of overcome, which is that um, it ripens incredibly fast. Okay, so if you think about a banana, we say you grow the banana in Costa Rica or Ecuador or Guatemala, wherever it's grown. The fruit is mature. So the seeds of the fruit, if you plant them, they'll grow another tree. It's mature fruit. You can put that on a ship, whatever it is, and you can ship it to wherever, Columbus, Ohio, a big warehouse. As long as you keep it away from the ripening hormone, which is called ethylene, it'll stay in this sort of hard, you know, you can hammer nail with it, banana. Then you put the enzyme, it's just a gas, ethylene, small little gas, and they start to ripen. And within a week or so, they'll ship them down to the supermarket here in Athens and they have a little green tip and you reliably know that three, four days later, it's gonna have the spotty ones and, you know, Aunt Thelma likes the ones with the spots on them and Uncle Joe likes the ones with the green tips, you know, that kind of thing. Pawpaw's not like that. It's the same kind of fruit. It goes through that ripening process, but there's no way to slow it down. So once it gets to be mature, it's once it starts to ripen, it's going to go fast. And what happens is when it ripens, then it will fall off. It'll, it'll literally fall off the tree. Okay. Oh. So a lot of fruit that you collect in the wild is on the ground. It's falling off the tree. And so then there's critters. I don't know what they're, whether they're raccoons. I've heard of dogs, you know, that, I mean, uh -huh. they like the pawpaw too. So deer, I don't know, deer eat the pawpaw. Somebody probably knows that. Anyway. Um, I happen to know they don't eat the tree itself. So, because uh, I have a huge deer population and they don't eat uh, the trees, but sometimes they'll rub against them. So, a question then is can you pick the pawpaws when they're not quite ripe? And then can you get them to ripen by like putting them in a bag with a banana or something like that? No, that's uh, there's two different kinds of fruit. Pawpaw is in this category. There's two different kinds of fruit. There's kind like the 
banana, pawpaw, apple, avocado, the ones that you can ripen like that. And then there's the other kind, the, the fancy word for the fruits like the pawpaw is climacteric. And the non-climacterics are like an orange, for example, or a strawberry or a grape. They don't go through any sort of burst of ripening, right? They just sort of decay over time. So we're not talking about those. The rest of them, they, you, they have this, you know, they kind of seemingly going along and then boom, they go through this burst, right? They ripen. Okay. And so once you get one that's ripe, it's going to spread. It, it will naturally produce the ripening hormone that I described previously, ethylene, right? So, so it'll, it'll cause the rest of them to ripen. So one bad apple will spoil the whole barrel because the one bad apple is producing that ethylene causing the whole thing to flash up. So the question is a really good one. And it's the best way I can describe it is that once the fruit becomes mature, for a banana, you've got time. You've got a week on the tree where you can pick it before it's going to just flash off and ripen, all right? And you can pick it, you can put it on the boat, you can keep the ethylene away from it, manage it that way. Pawpaw, the time from when it's mature to the time when it just goes and is going to ripen by itself, nobody knows, but it's probably, I mean, literally it's probably minutes to hours, <laughs> right? It's just an incredibly short amount of time. You just can't control it. So and I've never heard ever of a pawpaw that has been picked, that has been sort of stored for a while and then caused to ripen after the fact. So it makes shipping them whole, makes the whole fruit shipment very difficult. So by the time you get them to where you're getting them, they're, you know, they literally have to be picked, packaged, put in the mail overnight that day. So yeah, very expensive process. So. Well, then we have another question. Um, they want to know, do different varieties ripen at different times? So not only do different varieties ripen at different times, there's not a what they call a once over harvest. So if you have a pawpaw tree, you're gonna be picking ripe pawpaws off that tree for several weeks, you know, two to three weeks, maybe even as long as a month. Okay, so even the same variety on the same tree is just gonna drop fruit over a long period of time, right? So a lot of, a lot of commercial harvesting is, you know, you put the nets underneath and you have some device usually attached to the front of a truck that bumps into the tree and causes everything to fall. And then you scoop all that off, right? Can't do it with a pawpaw because you've got hard as a rock fruit and over mature fruit as well. So yes, by variety, but also by tree. Yeah. So. Somebody points out, uh, sorry, I'm just reading. Um, it looks like the state of Ohio has two different official fruit trees. And they say that one of them is the tomato and the other one is the pawpaw. Is, so is I, that correct? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think tomato grows on a tree. So I think the tomato, <laughs> is the, tomato is the official fruit of Ohio. Pawpaw is the official tree fruit of Ohio. So I think that's the distinction. Uh, I, I've got it. Um, I know that a long time ago there was an argument about tomatoes being fruit or vegetable, but okay, now I know on what side Ohio is. Um, last question, maybe. Um, how are we going to market the pawpaw to make it a substantial market for Southeast Ohio? That's a good question. Can I go back to the fruit question real quick? Yeah, go for it. Just quickly on the fruit question, there's different parts of the plant that you can use for, for food, right? You can use right. the underground, the bulbs and the tubers and the roots and the, what's this, the stem and yep. the leaves and the flowers and then the fruit, okay? So fruit on a plant carry the seeds. That's just what it is. So then this whole thing about whether it's a fruit or vegetable is basically how you use it from a culinary point of view, right? So that's this sort of the difference there. So just however you okay. come down from that one is fine. So the question you're asking is a great one. And it's one, first of all, that the industry isn't at a point where it can really, really grow fast. And like any kind of agricultural industry, it takes time in order to do that. So part of the work that the way, part of the way that I've been trying to approach this is you need to identify the varieties that are going to do the best here. And those varieties are going to give you big fruit. We need to have the skins to be as tough as they can because the harder the skin is, the easier it's going to be to separate it off. Part of the problem right now is when you try to process this thing, the skin's so soft, you get a lot of skin in there and skin's very sour. 
Um, you'd like to have not that many seeds, right? So you have more fruit. You'd like to have bigger fruit. You'd like to have sweet fruit, right? You'd like to have fruit that gives you this once over harvest. So compared to the apple industry or, you know, any of these mature pre peaches, right? We just, we know so little about the pawpaw and their different varieties. So we're a while away from that, okay? Um, if you could compare it to a pomegranate, okay? So pomegranate is a fruit that we here in the United States, we see one variety of pomegranate, that's it, one. And the reason we only see one variety of pomegranate is because there was a benefactor, okay? Who put all this money in, found this one pomegranate that grew well in the desert Southwest um, and started growing it and then started funding research, okay? And that's when pomegranate got this halo of health around it, right? Everyone wants to eat that mm -hmm. pomegranate. But it's a yeah. single variety. Now, there's plenty of varieties of pomegranate out there. It's just we only have one here. And so we're nowhere near that with the pawpaw right now, right? So until then, it's just going to be, a, you know, more trees come around. We're going to have more awareness. We're going to sell it at the farmer's market. Maybe there's a company that has enough of it where they can get it into their local grocery store for a time in the fall. The packaged industry, frozen packs or you know, those kinds of things, just increasing awareness about it that way so okay well a follow-on question from uh sydney she they want to know how does the papa industry compare here in ohio to other countries but also to other states in the u.s so there's very so let me answer the question this way there are other countries that grow the pawpaw in most cases and i think in all cases but i'm not 100 percent sure the the pawpaw was brought to those countries from the United States. So you can almost always trace it back. So there's pawpaws in Italy and Romania and places in Central Europe. Um, there's a lot of pawpaws in Korea. About five or six or eight years ago at the pawpaw festival, there was a gentleman from Korea who wanted to buy as much seed as he could. And actually the price of seed was more valuable than the pulp for a couple of years because they were um, they had a goal in Korea to plant one pawpaw tree for every person in Korea. OK, because they believe okay, I need to stop you there. Why? That, well, that's they, just fascinating because they believe that it is a super fruit, that it has these qualities beyond wow. basic nutrition that everyone should be eating they have the climate for it. So I, I haven't followed up with that in terms of like where those trees are now. They must be bearing fruit at this time. So there really isn't an industry that I know of outside the U.S. And state to state, I mean, you're really kind of in the epicenter of where it is here, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, a little bit in southern Michigan. Um, and But it's very, very small. I mean, it's just small. It's, it's local farmers with a few acres of trees or it's people that are harvesting wild pawpaws and trying to process them down. The largest pawpaw processor in the world is here. It's Integration Acres over in Albany, uh, Michelle Gorman and Christian. So, okay. Um, somebody wants to know if there are any pawpaw trees planted on Ohio University property, and if not, why not? Well, I haven't. I haven't seen any intentionally. Oh yeah, there are. There are, there are a few trees over by the student farm, over off uh, by uh, off of West State back in there. And I don't know whether those were planted and are named varieties or whether they were just there, but there's a few over there um, that there may, I mean, Ohio University owns, you know, all that land up by the ridges. There might be some up in there. I've never seen them up in there, but I uh, know there's no, so other than that field plot that we have ever on East State, Ohio University is really not a big ag school, right? I mean, that would be Ohio State. So, you know, we don't have these big, you know, acres and acres and acres where you can plant them. If you ever drive out to Cincinnati on Highway 32, about halfway out, just maybe closer to us than that. It's uh, Piketon, Ohio, Ohio State University has a, an a ag experiment station out there and they have like fish ponds out front. They've, that's Ohio State, they've planted a whole bunch of pawpaw out there. And those mm -hmm. fruits are just coming to maturity now. Kentucky State University down in Frankfurt is what's called the germplasm. So they have, um, they're a USDA uh, repository, so they, are the place that holds the genetic material of the pawpaw. So they have almost all the varieties that can grow there. There, So, yeah, I don't know. Was that, was that an answer? 
It's totally an answer. Well, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity on everybody's behalf to say thank you for sharing your experiences and your expertise with us for the Science Cafe. And I just wanted to remind everybody <laughs> yay, uh, that the next Science Cafe will be uh, Monday. Uh, on, I believe, October 1st, uh, it will be Larry Whitmer uh, talking about dinosaurs live from his lab. But until then, we just want to thank Rob Brennan for talking about pawpaws. Thank you very much.